appreciate you coming out tonight and practice appropriate social distancing. Uh, Awana has taken over the building on uh, Wednesday night, and uh, that's fine. We had a really good club uh, last Wednesday. I believe we had 29 or 30 kids. Uh, had plenty of help. Things went off like clockwork, and it was a real blessing. Um, but obviously, we believe in corporate prayer, and so until the foreseeable future, I'm anticipating until the fall anyway, I mean, throughout the fall, we probably will have our prayer meeting on uh, Monday night. I want to begin uh, in our study time tonight a, a series on, on discouragement. I don't think it's hard, really, to, uh, to figure out why. Uh, we'll be looking at it from a, a biblical uh, perspective. In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, the strategies that he uses against us. And it's interesting that within that context, he is speaking of isolation, in that the uh, church has uh, disciplined an individual who needed to be disciplined. The individual had repented, and Paul said, you've got to get this man back into fellowship now. Otherwise, he's going to be isolated. And what is one of the things that we have been dealing with in the last six months? Uh, the isolation, and not because of church discipline and a lack of repentance or anything like that. But folks, it just, it, it just isn't normal. As you study life, and more importantly, as you study the Word of God, you're going to find that there are three major strategies in Satan's bag of tricks. And uh, the first one, these aren't in any particular order. Uh, the first one is that he deceives. He is always attacking the veracity of the word of God, uh, the authority of the word. He is always attacking the goodness of God. He is still saying to people corporately and individual, yea, have God said. We need to understand that. Biblical illiteracy, uh, which abounds in our culture, uh, ties into that. I am thankful that that is not a problem uh, that we have here. Uh, very thankful for that. There are ministries that struggle uh, with the authority of the Word of God and proclaiming the whole counsel of the Word of God. His second strategy is that of, of dissension. Uh, getting believers uh, attacking, nitpicking, biting at each other. And if you think about that, folks, and you tie that in with our Lord's statement in the Gospel of John, unity is so essential because Jesus said, Father, I pray that my followers might be one, as you and I are one, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Dissension is an attack, succumbing to an attack that indirectly attacks the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and proof of the incarnation. And we have seen a lot of that. Uh, those of us who are older that seem to proliferate uh, in the 70s, that uh, New England spirit that keeps us here uh, kind of worked against us in spiritual realms uh, in that decade. And it really uh, proliferated. And when Christians are fighting, we become nothing more than a joke to a watching world, because it's usually not of a doctrine, is it? It's usually the color of the felt in the offering plate or something really important like that. And then the third one is he discourages. Uh, he attacks us emotionally. Now, the common denominator of all three is that they divide or that they separate. And so we have another column here. When he deceives, he is separating me from God. In dissension, he is separating me from you. And when he discourages, he separates me from me. And that's what sin does. It separates. It will always create a wedge to some degree. From the enemy's perspective, and we would agree that Satan is not stupid, 
he has all of his bases covered, third column coming up, deception is an upward attack, dissension is an outward attack, and discouragement is an inward attack. And so all three dimensions uh, have been covered with those three. My observation is we all have a spiritual Achilles heel. Now, we could be prone to any one of them. But I think, because of our sin nature and the way that we are, I have observed that most people are prone to one of these. Some people are not grounded in the Word of God. They are prone to deception. Some people are just fighters by nature, always looking to pitch a, pitch a, pick a fight. Uh, dissension is theirs. And then discouragement. Uh, personally, uh, I know that my Achilles heel is discouragement. Uh, I'm kind of ashamed to admit that. It's kind of embarrassing uh, to admit that. I, I have a pretty good handle, I think, on the scripture and truth. I know the importance of unity, but yet, you know, it's the emotional thing. And, you know, there are people out there who don't even think I have emotions. Uh, but yet, no, that, that is not true. Uh, believe me. And I think, guys, that, that discouragement is kind of the elephant in the room sometime. It's the one we don't like to talk about because it expresses weakness and people are going to think I'm weird or I've been taking my medicine or something like that. But yet it is, it, it, it's very real, if you will. Uh, a quote I read from C.S. Lewis just two weeks ago uh, said this, and Dr. Lewis said, this is his opinion, that if Satan had only one strategy, it would be discouragement. And that kind of surprised me, in a sense. But that's what C.S. Lewis thought. And I, uh, I, think, I think there's a lot to think about there, beloved. One of the things then that why I wanted to share this with you this fall, it's within the course of the pandemic, in that the mental health issues have just proliferated. And I can find very few, you know, good things, if you will. Alcoholism is up. Drug use is up. Meth use is up in Maine. Meth deaths are up in Maine. Divorce rates are up. One of the biggest Google searches right now is how to get a divorce. It, it's a pandemic. I, I read last week, cracked teeth are up. Do you know why? How do a lot of people handle stress? They grind their teeth, don't they? Yeah, and you can do it to such a degree that it just, yeah. So, I mean, the dentist industry is loving it. I mean, everything. Uh, with children, grades are down, comprehension levels are down, reading levels are down, math levels are down. Everything that ought to be up is down. Everything that ought to be down is up, basically. Uh, tonight on the news, how the pandemic is food insecurity. Uh, which is already a big issue in Maine, and the isolation and the layoffs and the economy are just making it, uh, making it worse. One of the things that really uh, pushed my buttons a couple of weeks ago, a nationwide Gallup poll of 18 to 24-year-olds, 25% admitted that they had considered suicide in the last month. That is scary. Isn't it? Now, I don't know to what degree. I don't know for how long. That wasn't part of the survey. But to even admit that in a national survey is shocking, isn't it? And I would say to anyone who's watching or anyone who will be watching this, if you're in that category and that's you, please, please don't. What a tragedy. The heartbreak of those you leave behind will be with them for the rest of their lives. Please, reach out, get some help. This is going to pass. You will get through this. Please, please, don't take your own life under any set of circumstances. And so there's a lot 
of emotional discouragement out there in our culture right now. And at present, with not a lot of, quote, light at the end of the tunnel, a lot of fear out there as we know. When we talk about discouragement, beloved, we're dealing with an emotion, something else sometimes that we overlook, that we don't necessarily like to talk about in Christendom. You know, it's a sign of weakness or things like that. I think emotions are understood. I think they're underestimated. Uh, sometimes we, we say something stupid like, oh, don't be so emotional, and please never say that to somebody. Emotions make you an image bearer. They're, it's the fruit of the Spirit, basically. God has an emotional package. Now, it's perfect, but that's where we get our emotions from. In order to have personality, you need intellect, volition, and emotion. And so without emotion, we wouldn't have personality. And it's powerful, aren't they? They're powerful. You think of them, some of the most powerful things you experience every day, they are emotional responses, beloved. You know, commercials. You watch a commercial, it makes you smile. You see something on the news, it makes you angry. Some of the most powerful things you experience are emotional responses. And so emotions are not the problem. They should not be minimized but like everything else in life, they need to come under the control and the power of the Holy Spirit. Probably one of the best illustrations of emotions that I saw a number of years ago, I got this from Focus on the Family, uh, is the sine curve. And so the straight line represents a normal personality. We all can do that in church, only in church, because as soon as we walk out of here, we're all abnormal. Normal is a setting on a dryer, we know that. Uh, we're all a little squirrely, as we say at our house. And some of us are squirrelier than others, and we feed the squirrels, and they're entertaining as all get out, but you know what they do. But we have to have a baseline, basically. So the straight line is a normal personality. Everyone's emotions go up and down on a sine curve. Everyone's. Guys, even ours. Everyone's. You woke up in the morning, and you thought, today, I can do anything. So have an eye. You woke up three days later and you thought, today I can do nothing. <laughs> and so have an eye. And physically nothing had changed. You were still healthy, everything like that. It's where you were in your emotional cycle. My theory here up in New England, I think a lot of us are solar powered. Watch people after three days of gloom. Uh, what's it called? Seasonal disorder, a pattern, and for a lot of people it starts this time of the year, even though we still have 12 hours of daylight, because they know what's coming November, December, then January, uh, if you will. Uh, you know, November, if you're a deer hunter, is a great month, but on average, out of the 30 days in November, 16 of them are cloudy. <laughs> That gives you something to look forward to in the next six weeks, doesn't it? Uh, there's not much sunshine. You're January, the days are short. We know that. I think the sun, I think light has, has a lot to do with it, uh, personally. But everyone's emotions go up and down on a sine curve. Basically, some people go way up. It's not right, it's not wrong. But as high as you go is as low as you go. Some people don't go up very high. They don't get down very low. That's how I'm wired. Uh, Connie and I recently discovered, though, sometimes my lows are lower than my highs are high. And that's a good thing to know about myself. And it, I think the gene pool is very strong here. Again, this will either comfort you or horrify you. I believe that most of us are wired like one of our parents, uh, basically. Apples don't fall far from trees, even on windy days. Now, that doesn't mean we're robots, if you will. That doesn't mean that we are captive. But I, you know, I see it with, with our children. Uh, we see a multi-generational connection now between grandfathers and grandsons and emotional packaging and stuff like that. Uh, that DNA stuff, beloved, is just really, really strong. And so I just saved you a ton of time and money on psychotherapy. Just write a big check to the church, okay? 
and we will say thank you because you don't need to go to psychotherapy. I just solved most of your problems. How's that? Uh, it's, yeah, it, it's the gene pool, if you will. And, and so you just, you just need to be aware of this pattern. And again, beloved, we aren't trying to change anyone, but emotions need to come under the pattern, if you will, or the power, the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so those days when you're up or way up, he needs to be in control of your emotion. And on the days that you are down or on your way down, he still needs to be in control of your emotions. But to me, that, that simple little diagram is, is very, very helpful and very, very uh, valuable, if you will. When we speak then of emotion... And we talk about discouragement, encouragement. The root word is courage. And that word encourage in the Hebrews, and the Hebrew language gives us a lot of insight here, folks, because the Middle East people are more demonstrative. They are more emotional uh, than we are. And there's a lot of good insight on discouragement in the, uh, the Old Testament, and we will attempt to draw on some of that. But courage is the idea of having an established heart. It's being established emotionally. And that's a good thing. And so when I am encouraged, then my heart is established or it is on the pathway to becoming established. Dis, to discharge, when I am discouraged, then I am losing that established heart. Again, another diagram that I think is very helpful. You all looked at one on your way to church tonight. Is that of a gas gauge? We all have an emotional tank. And we know that just like you can't run on fumes, your vehicle, at least not for very long, you have to gas up on occasion. We have to put emotional fuel, or you can think of that as a bank account, we have to make emotional deposits in our lives. And that is essential, folks. Think about this just for a moment. I would suggest to you that when you encounter people or circumstances, very few are neutral. Most of the encounters you have, most of the things that happen to you, it moves the needle one way or the other, doesn't it? No, not necessarily, you know, for very long. Uh, the, the other day, I was here, it was, uh, today's only Monday, it was one day last week. I, I left uh, late afternoon, I came out of the driveway, I took a turn uh, right, I wanted to get on the Marston Road. Uh, there was an elderly man on a bicycle. I wanted to give him his three feet. I slowed down. I pulled over. I'm kind of crawling by him uh, down there just before the bridge, on the other side of the bridge, a young guy in a pickup going way too fast. Uh, he saw the whole situation, didn't let off the throttle. I just kind of stayed where I did as soon as I could. I got by the elderly man on the bike. I pulled back in. About that time, you know, the young guy and I passed, and he waved to me, if you will. How's that? And I'm thinking, what's your problem, man? <laughs> I mean, pull over. Let's chat, okay? I'm usually carrying. No, 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 not really. I mean, no, we, no, we don't endorse road rage. <laughs> I mean, really, you, you've got to do something vulgar? Because I was obeying a main law by giving a cyclist three feet and just trying to be a decent human being? You know, I wasn't trying to be a jerk. I didn't run him off the road or anything like that. What did that do to my gauge, folks? I took a hit, didn't I? Now I've, I've gotten over it. Really, I have. Trust me, I just, it just was a perfect, you know, illustration. 
And you think about those, those encounters that you have. You've, you've had shoddy service somewhere. Not in central Maine, but somewhere. <laughs> and it made you uptight, didn't it? You've, you've had a positive experience with somebody. There are very few neutral experiences in life, beloved. Most of the things that we encounter impact us emotionally. And I would suggest in the last six months, based on the, the data that I am reading, for most Americans, or many Americans, the negative are outweighing the positive, and the needle is going down. And I don't want that to be us, beloved. I don't want that uh, to be God's people, uh, if you will. I really don't. And, and so, that, that is why, as God's people, we have been given this command in Hebrews 3.13. Exhort one another daily. Wow. That's how important encouragement is. We need daily encouragement. Now, unless you've got a real gas guzzler, you hopefully don't have to put fuel in your vehicle daily. But in your emotional tank, you need a fill-up, or you need something in there. Please, don't run on fumes. And I, my fear, that's where many, that's where many people are. They're, they're just running on fumes. They're on the verge of a breakdown or a meltdown. Uh, we'll look at some Hebrew words next week uh, that describe the various levels in the fuel tank. And uh, again, it can get scary uh, sometimes. We need to exhort one another daily. We know from the list of gifts in Romans chapter 12 that encouragement is so special. It is so necessary that we have spiritual specialists. There's a gift of exhortation. And you, that was something that Paul was very aware of. I believe that Paul's primary gift was encouragement. And Paul was usually in the presence of other people his team who encouraged him. And beloved, eight times in the Old Testament, you read this, be of good courage. I'll let you find those eight. It's a neat study. Good in the Hebrew is translated beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to have an encouraged spirit. It's a beautiful thing to put a deposit in someone else's life. And in a five minute conversation with a smile, with an appropriate gesture, you can do things like that, can't you? And I think we need to be aware of that. It pleases God and it's something that we all need. And then I'll conclude with this tonight. And this is a key, beloved. Fear never comes from God. Praise Him. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. There's a lot of it in our culture. I question some of the motives. I question the root. But it never comes from God. And as we recently saw in our Luke study, in Luke chapter 12, with fear and worry, those two things are passive. We don't, we don't necessarily like that, folks. And that they cannot come into our lives unless we give them permission. Wow. Please, don't give fear permission. Don't give worry permission. It's out there. Prayer is a primary resource. The promises are a primary resource. We'll talk about those things. But we're going to talk about the, some of the biblical things we can do to deal with discouragement, primarily toward the end of the study. But anytime we face fear or worry, it does not come from the Almighty, and we are giving it room, space, which God does not want us to give it. Those are just some words of, of introduction tonight. Uh, 
as we continue next week, again, I will give you the five levels on the gas gauge based on the Hebrew vocabulary uh, about encouragement. We will look at some of the, uh, the very common things uh, that drain our tanks and things like that. But I anticipate for um, most of our time together this fall that uh, we will be involved in this little study. And I just hope that uh, it's going to give some insight and it's going to be a blessing and give us some tools uh, on how to deal with it. For those of you who joined us online tonight, thank you. Uh, we here in the auditorium are going to take a corporate time and we're going to pray for kids. Our children are, are really uh, taking a hit uh, at this time. Uh, we're going to pray for local school systems, uh, for students and things like that. I'd encourage you to take a few moments at home uh, and do that. Maybe pray for a child that's in your life. And can I challenge you to do this as well at home tonight? Think of a student, someone, a child that you know that does not have an adult praying for them and pray for that child and just take them into the presence of God tonight and, and maybe throughout the school year or throughout the rest of the fall and just ask God to bless that young child and their daily routines and things like that because I, I truly believe, and I know you all would agree with me, that, that every child needs to have an adult praying for him or for her. And that's one of the problems in our culture tonight. We have a lot of young, we have a lot of children that they do not have an adult who is praying for them. And so I would encourage you to think about that challenge tonight. But we appreciate you joining us online. So thank you. We'll see you next Monday night.